Welcome to the Alan Elkan Interviews, an unprecedented window into the minds of some of the most well-known and respected figures of the last 25 years. Today, we are with uh, Edward Sancho Wynn, a very well-known English writer who became very well known because of his five books. Usually it's a trilogy, mm. in this case it's a fiftology, whatever it is, called The Melrose, no? Patrick Melrose. The, the Melrose novels, yes. Oh? Yeah. And then uh, The Melrose is a family name, which obviously you invented, and it's all about Patrick Melrose's life, adventures, and what happened to him, right? This is how you became very well known, and uh, five books, Never Mind, Bad News, Some Hope, Mother Milk, and At Last, which okay. form this fiftology. <laughs> which we invent. And then obviously there will be other books coming afterwards, we'll talk about them, like Dumba or Double Blind that you wrote after. But let's go back to the Patrick Melrose series, you know. You had the need or whatever, the urge or the desire or to write these books which are about yourself and your life and your family and what you endured as a child and later. Why did you decide to write your life like that? Well, I always wanted to be a novelist and uh, started writing a novel when I was 12 years old. Um, started a, a bad habit when I was 12 of reaching page 40, which seemed to be the ceiling of every novel I was able to write until I wrote Never Mind. And during my 20s, I started, I can't remember, perhaps three, perhaps four novels that reached page 40 and then had no reason to go on because they were merely playful or point scoring or satirical or clever and I knew that I was evading the central subject of the thing that I had uh, not told any other human being until I was 25 when I went into psychoanalysis after a suicide attempt and told my analyst that I would try and kill myself again unless I um, told him the truth about uh, my childhood. Never Mind was initially an expansion of that process. And I interrupted the psychoanalysis after four and a half years because I was frightened, which now seems to me utterly absurd, of becoming too well and no longer being motivated to sublimate this difficult material through So to writing, writing was your analysis in a way, you discovered it, it, that? It was related to analysis, but I regarded it as a completely distinct process. But I thought that analysis, which had been my friend in taking me from complete self-destruction, obsessive suicidality, to creativity, was going to be my enemy in that if I became completely reconciled with my past. I wouldn't be motivated to write this story. But what is strange is that in part you write it, in part it was written in your biography very soon, very early in your high school days. You became a drug addict, going up, going down, heroin, all that. How did you manage being such a drug addict to go to school, to go to Oxford, because even if you didn't have great results, you still went to Oxford, and then you were able to write. And then you had a girlfriend, you had a child, I mean, you had society life, and how this was possible with such an amount of drugs and drinking? Well, the addiction was really set in when I was 16. 16 was the disastrous year in my life, and at that point I already had had secured a pre-A-level place at Oxford, which was very unusual in those days, and they just said that I had to get very easy A-levels, and not even AAAs, BBC or something, and that I already had a place secured at 16. But that was the year in which I discovered drugs in a serious way, and then my descent was vertical, and it was a complete crash. Luckily, all my appetites were 
alive at the same time. And so I also was at lots of very good food. I think that's you probably did. what saved my life was that I wasn't only a drug addict, but I spent a lot of time in very good restaurants. Well, how did you manage to long, have a normal life? Long meals. I don't think my life was at all normal. I didn't, I didn't manage to have a normal life, is the answer to that question. Between 17 and 22, I was obsessively solitary, and I was completely fluid in my identity. I spoke... The whole time there's a chapter in Bad News, the Voices chapter in Bad News, which is a, just a snippet of what my inner life was like throughout those five years. And I spoke in every voice except my own. And I was in this perpetual theatre of impersonation, of compulsory impersonation. The only difference between me and a schizophrenic was that I was making the voices rather than hearing the voices. But I had to speak in those voices. I had no choice. So I was in a perpetual state of mimicry with the last voice provoking the next one, the next but one. Do, but do you think in your book you describe, therefore, it's public, no, the fact that you had been raped Yes. You know, abused by your father, right, when you were a child. Yeah. You had to keep that secret from you on the menace. He said to you, don't say this to anyone. And uh, Yes, he said that he would kill me if I told anyone. Yeah, and you write that in one of the books, right? Yes. You describe very well this scene, the beginning of that, your amazement, which you didn't even realize what it was at the beginning, mm. right? And he was fond of telling this story, which was clearly given our relationship of veiled menace to me, about when his regiment, was the fourth hussars, were sent on a tour of India. He was a very old father. He was born in 1906. So he went to India. His regiment was sent to India in the 1920s. And he went on a pig-sticking expedition with lots of very grand people in the Raj. And they were out in the Indian wilderness. One of the party developed rabies and they trusted it, tied him up and trusted him in a sort of net, which they tied to a tree. And he was there with hydrophobia, screaming and writhing in the net. And the rest of the party were having dinner and there's lots of silver on the table, lots of turban servants bringing food, and this man at some distance from the table screaming. And my father got up and went into his tent and got his pistol and walked over to the man and shot him in the head in front of everyone else at the dinner. And the dinner party fell silent, and my father sat down again and looked up and said much the kindest thing to do. Your strange father who was a doctor, which was not... He wasn't then. He was a cavalry officer and the, and son, he became a the son of a brigadier general. When he became a doctor, his father cut him off because he was too middle class but in occupation. When care. your father died, and you describe it well in one of the books, someone calls you up and says, you know, your father died and you have to come to New York. I mean, he died of... Uh, Suddenly in New York, and you were in England, you had to live with the Concord, you live. And you describe your trip, and you arrive in New York, and then you have to go to see his body. And in the meanwhile, you buy drugs in the park. You know, there are all these dealers. Yes. All what you describe is invention, or is what happened? That's a um, combination. There was indeed a trip to New York to collect my father's ashes, and a lot of the incidents were true to that particular journey. But at the same time, there was a compression of the whole history of my addiction into a single day, because each of these novels, except for Mother's Milk, is set in one day in one place. It has the classical unities, because I felt that the subject matter was so explosive that I needed the containment of that kind of classicism. And once you started publishing your books, you felt relieved? I, mean, I couldn't... Uh, 
I had a sublimely generous girlfriend called Anna Corbera who typed out never mind for me. I couldn't bear to read it. I almost wrote without looking at the page. I didn't associate writing it with relief at all, but with extreme, almost unbearable tension. I had to lie on the floor a lot and uh, I had panic attacks. I, I wasn't taking any drugs or drinking at all. It was very, very much on the edge of what I was capable of. Was I still smoked tobacco, but only cigars, because I had given up cigarettes, which I smoked very heavily. I didn't even drink coffee, just tea. And, and did you cigars. write longhand? Longhand, yeah, with a fountain pen on uh, pages, on loose pages, which I then posted over my shoulder. And then she typed them out. I still write everything longhand first, and then I rewrite it longhand. Mm -hmm. Then I transfer it to a computer. Mm -hmm. I print it out. I correct it by hand. And then I reprint it and correct it again, and then reprint it and correct it again. So, so you do your editing by yourself? I do my editing alone to begin with because my first draft is not a first draft at all, apart from with Nevermind, because it was so emotionally unbearable to write, I didn't edit it at all, I could barely write it, and it was thanks to Anna that it got typed out, and then I had to edit it afterwards. But my current method since my second novel, since Bad News, was to rewrite at the time, so that my first draft is in fact already a 20th draft or 30th draft, it depends it from page to page. But in your writing, there's a great language research, no? I mean, very, not any language is your language and it's a very sophisticated language. And then you like, if I'm not wrong, you describe a lot of details. For instance, I don't know, there is one of the books, this one, but uh, also in the, in the book Double Blind that you recently wrote, I mm. mean, not very long ago, there is a um, countryside description which is very precise and very accurated. And I don't know why English paintings by Ginsburg came to my mind by reading that, you know, the, the English countryside, the, mm. the details. And you're very attentive to nature details. And also, I think in this book, you also, scientific descriptions are very precise, you know. How do you do that? I think I have a strong visual imagination. And so I write what I see in my mind's eye. But I don't try and describe things exhaustively. You mentioned Ezra Pound at the lunch. Ezra Pound has this phrase, you know, the luminous detail. I suppose what I'm interested in is the luminous mm. detail, you know, the, the minimum amount that you can say, which tells you everything else about a room or about a person. It may be the way they speak, it may be the way they dress, you know, there's always a selection. My descriptions of the house in France, they're very compressed, but I hope that the reader has a very builds for themselves a picture. Are you in love with the English language? If I could speak more languages, I'm sure I'd be in love with them as well. I'm, I'm in love with precision, beauty, with in elegance, with wit, with... I have to use the English language. Like, the trouble with being a writer as opposed to being a composer is that people don't get up in the morning and talk to each other in symphonies or paint an oil painting of what they want for lunch. You know, they just write a shopping list. I mean, we use words all the time. It's a very tarnished medium. And then to try and turn it into art is a a particular kind of effort, which is unlike the effort of making art out of. Is the writing coming as a flow? Well, the yeah. similes are just gifts from my imagination. I am not my imagination. My imagination gives me these things, which is very generous of it. And my troubled personality does what it can with, with what my imagination gives me. And then 
Dialogue comes relatively easily because of this history of mimicry and impersonation. So, although that's very weak now, I hardly impersonate anyone. But because I did it so compulsively for so long, dialogue is sometimes just like eavesdropping. I just, but describing things, what you were talking about earlier, the Gainsborough, as you saw it, landscape, or just describing things, that's very, very hard, and that takes a lot of hard work. But Foster, who stayed in the same university, wrote a book called How to Write, or something like that, Right. and he said one has to know very, very, very well what he's writing about, right? In order to say just a little thing, you have to know so much more. That's been one of the problems with Double Blind and its sequels, which I, I'm now perhaps 60% of the way through the sequel to Double Blind, there will then be a, a third novel, I think, is that I've had, in order to write what turns out to be maybe two or three paragraphs about epigenetics or about <laughs> genome-wide studies or something, I've had to read 12 books, and, you know, and I'm a very slow reader. And then I have to throw away 99.9% of what I've read, because otherwise the reader would be completely crushed with boredom. So distilling things or filleting things, whichever metaphor you want to use, is one of the most difficult things about writing that book specifically. And about anything, you have to have experienced a lot of it and thought about it a lot in order to yes, say anything. Yes, there is a lot of work. There's a lot of your work. work. Okay. Yeah, but once you spend 20 years writing, you know, all these novels and all this story, <clears throat> was it difficult to write other books, to, to become also the author of Dumba or the author of Double Blind, is to other novels? It's always family, it's always displaced situations. After all, maybe writers can only write about family matters. Double Blind is not particularly family-centered, no. but Dunbar certainly is, but that's because it's based on King Lear. The engine under the bonnet, the common driving force of all my work, is a desire for freedom. It's a jailbreak. It's an attempt at liberation of some sort or another. And in the case of the Melroses, it's very clear that I wanted to be liberated from my conditioning, from my class, from my trauma, from my personal past. That was the prison that I needed to break out of. And with Double Blind, which I'm writing a sequel to now, there's going to be a new series. I'm trying to make a new world rather than just write it. That's a world of... It's about science. It's about the, the prison in this case is a much more uh, general prison. It's a, it's a prison of the scientific, materialistic worldview and the way in which we're invited to think about consciousness and science. It's much more of a, a cultural and educational prison that I'm trying to... From my point of view, that the, 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 they're like the lower lid and the upper lid of the same eye, you know, with the same gaze, which is, you know, how do I get out of here? The world of double blind originates really in another thread, the other major thread in my work, which is about the nature of consciousness. I went to a, a conference in 1996 called Towards the Science of Consciousness, and I was very intrigued to find that consciousness, which is the only thing we know we have, and the basis of everything else that we think we know, is not included in science's majestic description of the world. So how good a description can it be if it can't tell us what is actually going on in the relationship between um, experience and experiment? These two different kinds of narrative, the first-person narrative of experience and the third-person narrative of experiment. 
refuse to be reduced to each other. And, and this is the problem that I'm obsessed with. I started writing about in a book called A Clue to the Exit, which I wrote in the late 90s, which I picked up again in Double Blind, and which I'm going to continue with. That's the other kind of prison, but a much more impersonal prison, one in which I think we're all trapped. And, and how is your personal life? I'm not motivated to You are trapped write. in your personal life at the moment? No, I'm not particularly trapped in my personal life. It's rather a luxury to have lost interest in my personal life yeah. and to be much more fascinated by the questions that I'm writing about in Double Mind. It's also art. difficult to transform knowledge into a novel without being boring and without being like an essay, right? Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Which is something else. You are only a fiction writer. I'm a fiction writer, and that is what I am. To write a novel of ideas is something which is not a strong English tradition. Um, it's, much, it's a much stronger European tradition. It's a French idea. It's idea. a French or German, and Thomas Mann's a novelist of ideas. But I think along with the having to be a jailbreak in order for me to do something as difficult and anxious-making as write a novel, there also has to be the feeling that it's almost impossible, that whatever I'm doing is almost impossible. It's almost impossible to... The subject has to be impossible or audacious or ill-advised in some way. But you're a good writer. Yeah. You know, after all, you write and people read, right? And then they look, it's like looking at a painting. Each one of us will have a different feeling. The first year I was published was 1992. And the year that Mother's Milk was shortlisted for the Booker Prize was, well, I can't actually remember, but was it 2006, 2007, something like that? I had at least 14 years of total obscurity and then things changed. And just in time, because I was broke, I was selling everything I had, really, and I thought I just couldn't afford to continue my vocation. And then suddenly I was earning a living as a novelist, so that was very good timing. Now I've, I've written Double Blind and it's very different from my other, or appears to be very different, but for me, as I say, how do we get out of here? Of the gate. And the here is the materialist worldview and its painful consequences, you know, dualism, fragmentation, a kind of schizoid mentality in which you're told to believe one thing and in fact you believe a set of quite different things and but you don't want to admit to them because they sound unscientific, etc., etc. All the sorrows of the consequences of the authority of the double-blind method of rejecting, you know, the merely anecdotal, whereas everything we have, all of experience, is an anecdote. And science is a subset of experience. It's not some kind of autonomous authority which can dismiss experience. And anyway, a lot of parts of science, astronomy is an anecdote. You can't perform, if you're looking at a quasar through your telescope, you can't get a second quasar as a control group to look at at the same time. That's just it. It's the anecdote of what you've seen in that moment. This method is not applicable across the board, even within science, let alone within life. And this problem, and the problem of not being able to describe consciousness, not being able to describe identity within science, and yet science claiming to be, you know, the most authoritative description we have of reality, seems to me a very serious one. It disturbs me, and that's the jail I want to break out of. If I haven't made it sound like enough of a jail, believe me, that's what my current work is dedicated to doing. And if it takes a while for people to get interested in it, well, that's happened to me before I spent, you know, 14 years being ignored. Are you interested by other writers? Are you reading other 
contemporary writers? I don't read contemporary fiction because it doesn't generate any useful emotion. I, either I'm intimidated or I'm contemptuous, and neither of them are useful. I read things to do with what... I've read a lot of science because of Double Blind and its sequels. I sometimes read old fiction, people who are safely dead and incontrovertibly is there, uh, great. Is there in your life, uh, in French, they say, un livre de chevet, you know, a major book in your life? I think there are just major writers. It's a very obvious list, you know, they're very Joyce and Proust and Flaubert and Beckett and, you know, stylists, people who've been obsessed with the possibilities of the sentence. You know. Henry James as well. These are often authors who I haven't read for a very long time, but they remain guiding stars. If a friend of mine writes a novel, then I'll read their novel. But that's to do with friendship. It's not to do with keeping up with the contemporary scene. Thank I, you. Thank you. Alan L. Can interviews.